Welcome to the Buy Box Experts Podcast. We bring to light the unique opportunities brands face in today's e-commerce world. This episode is brought to you by Buy Box Experts. Buy Box Experts takes ambitious brands and makes them unbeatable. They have a team of consultants that will identify key low-hanging fruit for some of your best-selling ASINs on Amazon. So if you are an Amazon seller and you want to make more revenue, then go to buyboxexperts.com. Click on the free analysis button. It's completely free, no strings attached. Um, They have some limited time because they only have a handful of of consultants that do this. So at some point they might decide not to offer it anymore. So go to buyboxexperts.com. Today, we have Greg Mercer, the founder and CEO of Jungle Scout, the leading software for Amazon sellers. He leads a team of over 125 employees all around the globe. Jungle Scout is all about empowering small businesses on Amazon to get to the next level. Greg and his wife, Liz, are travel junkies, to say the least. They've been all over the world, Burning Man, Bali, South America, you name it. Check out his Instagram. It's seriously just bright pictures and wonderful traveling. Greg, welcome to the show. Eric, thanks a lot for having me on. It's going to be a fun 30 minutes chatting with you. Yeah, let's, let's jump right into it. Uh, so first and foremost, I want to talk about uh, brand analytics. It's the most recent change that Amazon has made as of this recording. Um, they've been doing a lot of other things that are making people in this space pretty upset when it, in regards to reviews and stuff like that. And I know that Jungle Scout launched Keyword Scout prior to the brand analytics being available. And I'm sure your team is, is you know, working on ways to incorporate that into the tool. Can you tell me a little bit about you know, the process of using brand analytics inside of Jungle Scout and what kinds of insights brands can garner at a high level? And then just an example of how you might have used this data to gain a competitive advantage for, for some of the brands that you manage. Yeah, great question. So uh, a few different pieces there, right? So I guess for the listeners, just real quick, if you're not familiar with brand analytics, I know a lot of you guys are, but now for third-party sellers who are brand registered, you can get access for free to something called brand analytics. It gives you the rank of all keywords that are searched on Amazon, like one through like 2 million or whatever it is in the US. And then, so like right now I'm on there, like AirPods was the number one searched term in the past week on Amazon. And then the other cool thing is it gives you like the top three listings, uh, how much click share as well as how much convert, conversion share that they received. So this is pretty cool information. So like your, I, your first question was, uh, like how do you incorporate that into the tool? So we actually don't incorporate in the brand, brand analytics stuff into Jungle Scout. And the reason for that is uh, Amazon doesn't like that. <laughs> hmm. So they... Um, we, we have a pretty like close relationship with Amazon. We always want to make sure that they're happy and they're uh, pretty particular about making sure that this information stays confidential for the people who it's released to. And then it's not kind of like republished and like given out to other people. So we don't incorporate it into our tool. But that being said, it is really nice to know like this, uh, the data because we have our own algorithms to estimate search volume on Amazon. And one of the ways that we just kind of like gut check things is it's like, okay, we're estimating that AirPods gets 100,000 searches per month. And, um, you know, iPad gets 80,000 searches per month. So like, does that like make sense? It's like, okay, yeah, like AirPods is uh, ranked over iPad and brand analytics. So we can kind of do like gut checks like that, but we don't directly use the data inside of Jungle Scout. And so to date, I know you have a whole bunch of brands that you yourself have launched and and you've mentioned before that they're not necessarily clustered together in in specific brands. They're just market opportunities that you've been able to find and and create products for. Have you used the the brand analytics for for any of those brands um, to date and how have you used those? Yeah, great question. You know, the brand analytics to me, it's one of those things that it's like, it's cool. And like, I do go and check it out from time to time. And it's like interesting data to see, oh, like, um, wow, you know, this, whatever, uh, this, these wireless uh, earbud, earbuds are getting a ton of clicks, but their conversion's terrible. <laughs> or it's like, it's kind of interesting information like that. But that being said, I haven't actually found that many ways, to, like directly actionable ways to like apply it to help my business. Hmm. Now, of course, keywords are really important, but like at the end of the day, when I'm choosing which keywords that I want to target or how I want to optimize my listing, you know, like things in that area, I usually find like 
of course I'm like a little bit biased because I was the one that built like the jungle scouts keyword research tool. But I think most people would actually agree with me that like it, it just makes it easier to find the keywords that are most relevant for your product just because of like it, the, like the keyword match engine that we use is like pretty cool and sophisticated. So, um, you know, to directly answer your question, I haven't found it that useful for like directly impacting my business, even though I do find myself in there reading it, but it's more so like, I don't know, kind of like out of fun or curiosity. <laughs> yeah. Almost like anecdotal information. Yeah. Now I'm, so I'm a seller, right? And, and most of the people who listen to this podcast are Amazon sellers or their brands who are looking to, to sell on Amazon. And so are there any other you know, pieces of data that Am maybe Amazon provides to you or even the, maybe the, the Jungle Scout tool provides that brands might not know how to use. You know, they kind of look at it and they shake their heads and they're wondering how to make decisions. Is there anything like that that, that you can kind of guide people through who may be listening? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, of course, keyword search volume. And that's, you know, kind of, uh, that's related to like the brain analytics, right? I was thinking like which keywords are more popular. So even if you weren't using Jungle Scout or weren't using a different keyword research tool, you could use brain analytics for that. And of course, that's because it helps you decide which keywords are the most popular. And sometimes I even decide like, okay, this keyword's actually the most popular, but it's so competitive that I'm actually going to choose to put like these other, like the second, third, and fourth most popular ones in my title because I just know that I can like rank for those more easily. Um, other pieces of data that I find really useful, historical search volume and historical sales for my competitors' ASINs. Uh, those are, of course, are like great gauges of seasonality. I always get the question of like, how much is this going to sell during this period uh, of time or uh, yeah, just other information other questions around that trying to determine like seasonality or whether a, a certain like niche or opportunity is kind of like trending upwards over the years or trending downwards. They'd be both like great gauges of that. So those are uh, the two things that I use. I'm trying to think what else are, like extremely useful that a lot of like the brand or like big brands. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned, don't use B enough. you mentioned BSR when we were talking before mm -hmm. how, and this, and it's funny cause I, I talk with brands every day, right? That's, that's my, my role with buy box experts is um, you know, where are you at on Amazon and how do you get to the next step? So for the, for all those people that are looking at, at BSR, what do you tell them, right? Like, what do you do with this number? How do you, how do you make decisions with this random number that, that Amazon and these tools give to you? Yeah. You know, I think that, so again, any listeners who like aren't familiar with bestseller ranking, most of you guys probably are, but right. Like Amazon ranks all the products in their, or almost 99% of their products in their catalog in their particular, both subcategory as well as main category, like one through a million or however many products are in there. Right. So if you're ranked like number 100, you're the 100th bestseller in that particular category. Now, Back in the day, like before Jungle Scout came out and similar tools and stuff to estimate sales, like based off of these numbers, it was like a really valuable number, right? Because it was like, it was kind of the only thing we had to gauge demand. I mean, maybe the amount of reviews they've gotten like over a period of time or something like that, maybe that would be like an indicator, but nothing was as good as like bestseller rank. But now that like again, I'm not just trying to promote Jungle Scout because like there's competitors that do this too. But like now that these tools exist that can use this number to like estimate sales to a pretty high level of accuracy, like the bestseller rank now is like just not as, in, as important or like as helpful because, you know, I'll see people who are like, uh, oh, the, uh, like it's a BSR of a thousand in appliances and I have another product that's a BSR of a thousand in sports and outdoors and it sells 10,000 a month. So it must, and appliances also. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, actually there's a huge difference in some of these categories, like sports and outdoors is one of the biggest categories. A thousand in there is probably like 10,000 units per month. Whereas the BSR of a thousand appliances is probably like a hundred units a month. Right. So that's why, uh, that's why it's just not that useful for most people or can, even be misleading for a lot of people. Okay. Right on man. Misleading. I, you know, I'm sure there's a, there's a ton of people who listen to this, who look at BSR and just have no idea that it's, it's almost like an archaic piece of data that is not yeah. relevant because you have a deeper level that you can get into with 
like the, the estimations of revenue that Jungle Scout offers, which I use every day. Yeah. Um, switching gears for a second. Now, I was listening to one of your webinars. Um, I, I think it was maybe a month or so ago. And you mentioned something really specific that I want to I wanna dive into. That consumer behavior over the last 20 years or so has shown that people are caring less and less about the brand and they're, they're more concerned with social proof that the brand is able to showcase. And you specifically mention reviews and price. So two questions for you. First one, um, how do you see price as a form of social proof? I think that's, that's really interesting. And second, how would you encourage brands to garner more reviews now that Amazon is steering away from using, you know, these third party tools like feedback Wiz and feedback genius. What do you think? Yeah, great questions. So, um, the first one, I don't think the price is necessarily for social proof. I was saying they may still use as like a gauge of quality. So a little bit more of like a background of uh, my like opinion on this that um, Eric had a chance to listen to is 20 years ago before, you know, you were doing online shopping, uh, brand marketing was extremely important. And this was because this, the knowledge or understanding of a brand and the like either the quality or the other just like values that they represented were very important very important for your purchasing decisions so an example of this right i go to these uh, uh sporting goods store i'm looking for a sleeping bag and they have like the coleman sleeping bag the north face sleeping bag and whatever the marmount sleeping bag it's like, okay, I'm familiar with all these brands. Like Coleman, it's probably going to be like low priced, might represent like a decent value if, you've like, if you're only going to use it once or twice a year. Uh, maybe like North Face is a little bit nicer and I know that it's going to be more expensive too. Like Marmount maybe is like the, the highest end sleeping bag, okay? So like, I don't know the actual quality of any of these sleeping bags. Like I probably can't get them out of the box and sleep in them for a night before I buy them. <laughs> but like I expect a certain level of quality from each of these particular brands. And over the years, they have spent tons of money on their brand marketing to get me to believe this way. And the reason that I think that that's a little bit of a, uh, like an archaic or starting to become an outdated thing is that like we you know, we cared about that brand because it represented like these certain values or like quality. But like now we, uh, we just value other people's opinions more than like the brand marketing. And it's so much easier to get other people's opinions now or the social proof through the review system, right? So now all of a sudden, like I wouldn't even look at, uh, you know, if I was looking for a sleeping bag, all of a sudden now, like I wouldn't even actually care about what brand makes it. I would want the highest reviewed product or like the review with the highest uh, star rating that was still like within my budget or my price range. So, and I would say this isn't true in all niches yet. A great indicator of what categories or niches it is important or isn't is like, you know, I think Amazon's already picked on to what I'm talking about. And that is, like if you search right now for uh, men's shorts or running shoes, the brand of those will be displayed on the Amazon search page. All right, so like clothing items or uh, purses or like anything that's used as like a way to represent like a little bit of a status symbol maybe. Hmm. Those things I think people still care about the brand about and Amazon realizes that and that's why they display the brand on the search page. But if you search kitchen knives or um, a sleeping bag or like whatever else, the brand's not even displayed on the search page. And I think it's because Amazon's realizing that that's actually not uh, very influential in people's purchasing behavior anymore. So your question was now like, okay, so how do people get more reviews? Because it's obviously a very important thing. I, ha I used to have a whole bunch of money in my brand marketing. Now I want to shift that to just getting more reviews. Yeah, review marketing, <laughs> we call it. Review marketing. <laughs> Um, of course, as you know, this is a, everyone's always very, very interested in this and there are very few solid ways to improve the amount of reviews that you get, uh, that Amazon is cool with, right? Um, you know, I don't think anything I say here is going to be like a surprise, but some people will include inserts in the boxes. 
you have to be pretty careful now about what those are saying because people are even getting in trouble for that. Uh, you know, it's my understanding that Amazon still does allow one follow-up email for a purchase asking for review, but you have to be extremely careful that it's not asked in any kind of biased way or you're not like guilt tripping them into right. leaving review. Um, so I think that still adds a certain level of review. Like it still gives you a, I believe like improves your review rate a little bit, even though it's pretty slim. Right. Um, you know, I think that like the early reviewer program or the, is worth the 75 bucks vine. I think they still charge quite a bit more for us. So I don't know if that's quite as valuable. And then other than that, you start to get into more gray hat or black hat type stuff, right? Like there is a tactic that a lot of people are doing that they claim is cool with Amazon, which is like, uh, sorry, this isn't, it's not specifically for getting reviews, but it's supposed to be like for getting more sales, which they'll, uh, they'll give like manufacturer rebates for a product, right? So it's like, they'll give you a 90% manufacturer rebate, buy for full price on Amazon, send it in or whatever. You get a 95% reimbursement. And then, uh, I think people, so one that's to get extra sales Two, I believe that that's sketchy. Cause I think that like you're kind of tricking Amazon by doing so. And then, depending on probably who you're doing that with it, it does feel like to me there in a lot of those areas or circles or clubs where there's kind of unwritten rules about like leaving more reviews. So I think that one personally is pretty sketchy and I haven't done it, but I just thought I'd throw it out there that I know people are doing it. Yeah. Right on. Okay. So there's a ton to unpack there. Mm -hmm. Um, reviews are a sticky subject, man. And, and you have to toe this line with Amazon because you, you have this, this software partnership with them where they provide a lot to you and um, you just got to make sure that you make them happy all the time. But as far as like inserts and emails and all that stuff goes, I mean, we've seen, we've seen brands get shut down for doing those things. You mm -hmm. know, like the little request a review button popped up on, uh, on the order page all of a sudden. And then Amazon didn't really say anything about it. So there's policy changes happening all the time that are, you know, really messing people up who have built tools around this, this, mm. this type of industry. My question for you though is, right, if, if we can't do, let's assume that we can't do product inserts and we can't do the post-purchase emails and we can't do warranties and we can't do manufacturer reimbursements or anything like that, then all we have left in terms of uh, talking with the customer and engaging with the customer is the listing. Right, we've got our seven to nine pictures and a video and the, and the content and, and the enhanced brand content down below. Do you feel like there is a way to build a listing so that you get more reviews? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. I've never really thought about it before, to be honest. I mean, like creating an excellent user experience is always going to be a way to like get more high quality reviews, right? So like there's little things that you can do there. There was, uh, I, I was talking to one person, just something that they do is they just uh, like put like a little handwritten note, like in each box. This is like a higher end item, right? And uh, I think they actually, they were trying it a couple of different ways. Like one, there was a little handwritten note and it did ask to like leave a review. And then the other one, there was just like a handwritten note that just said like, you know, um, it was like one or two sentences, just like, thank you so much for purchasing this. Um, it means so much to me. I handcrafted it, whatever. I don't know. Something like that's like make you like feel a little bit more of a connection. And like, actually without even asking for a review, they, it's really hard to track this stuff back. Right. But they believe that they were getting more reviews from it just because it was like this little extra something that like probably made the person smile when they opened it. And like, as a result, they just kind of like that product or that brand a little bit more. But as far as things you can do with the actual listing, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if Amazon would be cool with like putting text or things like hinting to ask to leave for even for like unbiased reviews. Uh, I haven't really seen those on Amazon before, but maybe you have. I don't know. What do you think? I've, I've got, so, it, and it's, it's funny, right? You're, you're looking at all these listings on Amazon each day. I saw one that had a picture of a dog and there was just a hand coming down and patting the dog on the head. 
and it said something to the effect of um, good boys leave reviews or something like that. <laughs> and it was, and it was really striking. And all I, all I could think was, wow, like I'm going to steal that idea. Cause that is a great idea, but I just don't know how Amazon's going to respond to that kind of thing. Right. Is that, are we talking gray hat here? I, yeah, I don't, I don't really think that's like gray hat. Uh, I think that's probably just the type of thing that if there's a few people doing it, it'll fly under the radar. If you start seeing those on everyone's Amazon listings, then there'll be a policy change saying that you can't do that, right? <laughs> like ultimately, that's not great for the Amazon user experience, right? You know, I don't think you're really going to get in trouble for that one or I don't even think they'd suppress the listing. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'd say that if it's effective and you start to see a lot of it, that there'll probably be a policy change around it. Right. <laughs> but I mean, that's yeah. kind of part of this, right? Like you kind of have to like find the little areas where you can get ahead, you know, w while playing inside of the current ecosystem or current rules. So yeah, I was I haven't seen one of those yet though. That's cool. Yeah. I, I saw a similar one. So I bought that product and it, uh, they had an insert in it as well. And uh, it was the same picture of that dog on the little product insert. And it said the same exact thing. And, I, uh, I left a review. Nice. <laughs> it worked on you. Cool. I think they, I think they flagged me though, because I work for an agency. So uh, maybe it didn't even come in as verified. Um, okay. The other question that I have for you is, uh, right. Pricing as this perception of quality. Mm. I mean, you look at like the weighted blanket category or, um, running sock compression socks, right? These are very, very saturated markets and the pricing is is fairly ubiquitous so i mean if somebody wants to make their product appear more luxury and let's say they have a really great listing do you think that simply increasing the price is going to is going to buy them into that that higher end of the market even though the people that they're listed next to are at a lower price yeah good question um I think it very much depends on the market. If this is a market that people really are willing to pay more for like a higher quality item, something they care deeply about, then I think it could, assuming you have like five out of five, like five star reviews, right? So it's like, you know, if, I mean, if you have like four star reviews, your competitors are half the price of four and a half stars or five stars, it's like, it's probably not going to work out for you. Right. But actually an example of this is, Man, I, I sell these bamboo marshmallow sticks. I started as a case study like four, like three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. And they have, let's see, 332 five-star reviews. And if you search like bamboo marshmallow sticks, um, man, my marshmallow sticks are priced at $29.95, whereas like everyone else on this entire page is $14.99, $21, $19, $19, $15, $14. $19. So mine are like double the price of a lot of other people on this page. And what's crazy is like I still sell almost as many as everyone else. It's the wildest thing. And this is like a 3 or $4 item, but Amazon fees are like 12 bucks. But I mean, I used to sell this thing for like 19 bucks, and you know, my margin was only like 20%. Now my margin's like 70 or 60% or something. It's crazy. <laughs> um, and I don't know if this is like the best example of a category that people care about, but it, it does go to show that assuming you do have great reviews, that there are some customers that are happy to pay more for items. But man, it's like, it's really hard like on a podcast like this to give like I think general advice around this because I think it cares so much about your niche, how your listing looks, like whether or not it looks like a high-end, really nice item and a lot about the reviews. So, but yeah, I don't know, like, I don't know why people are purchasing this for like the one next to mine's 15 bucks. Right. It's like the exact same thing. Mine's 30 bucks <laughs> and there's, man, a lot of people purchasing mine. <laughs> yeah, man. And it looks like people have even copied some of your branding as well with the STIX. You got jungle sticks in here and then you got bamboo sticks down below, marshmallow sticks, roast sticks. They all got that TIX. So everyone's stealing foodie sticks. They're all stealing. Right. Each other. Interesting. Yeah. And so, really, I just use STIX because the domain wasn't available for CKS. <laughs> <laughs> That's, you know, what? that actually, that segues into <laughs> another important point, right? So 
on that same webinar where you're talking about um, pricing and reviews and social proof, you, you mentioned that, and, and I don't, and I don't want to misquote you on, on this at all. Um, but you mentioned that the Amazon side of your business for a product company should, should get the bulk of your attention as opposed to your website. And mm. that might sound like a huge misquote. So I kind of want to clarify with you because all these people that I talk to, man, they're like, yeah, my sales are 90% on my website and I don't want to cannibalize sales by leveraging Amazon. And so first, you know, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? I'll give you a chance to clarify. And then what is the actual breakdown? What, what should these brands be doing? Yeah. So yeah, a little bit of clarification there. Um, the majority of the people that like I typically like interact with or work with are uh, either like kind of like Amazon first type brands or yeah, I'd say most of the small businesses that like we work with, they're like Amazon first type companies. Like they got into this because of the Amazon opportunity and the power of it. These are typically not like existing brands that have been around for a while. And for this particular group that I'm talking about, they, so like anyone you talk to like in e-commerce who the majority of their sales are on Amazon, they're all like so passionate about getting off Amazon and, um, you know, like doing all this work to try to like really improve their off Amazon presence and their own e-commerce site for all the reasons that like totally make sense that uh, you don't want to be fully reliant on one channel and that like you don't own the customer there and you can't do upsells or remarketing or whatever else, like all these really valid and good reasons. But <laughs> I also find that most of these people who are like Amazon first and are trying to get off, you know, it's like, all right, what percent of your day do you spend on your own e-commerce store and, um, you know, the, the uh, retargeting ads and like, you know, your email marketing, whatever else. It's like, oh, 60% of my day. It's like, okay, what percent of your sales are off Amazon now? And they're like, oh, 5%. <laughs> it's like, everyone's just so scared about being all in on Amazon that like they're so passionate about getting off Amazon. But just like the hours devoted to that, to uh, results ratio is like so skewed from the sellers that I work with, right? Uh, that it's like, dude, just stop being afraid of being all in on Amazon and just do what's work. Just do more of what's yeah. work. Double down, play to your strengths. Yeah. Hmm. Well, and, and it's interesting, right? You tell somebody who, especially those who are like 95% brick and mortar, you know, they're like, I don't want to, I don't want to piss off my distributors. I don't want to upset my website flow. That's a hard sell for them a lot of the time, especially with, you know, Amazon changing policies and some people's products getting shut down. And so for these small business owners, the, the main question that I have around this topic is, let's say that I run an Instagram ad and they end up on my website, right? You know, I'm, I'm trafficking straight to my website because I don't have fees on there. And I'm an Amazon Prime member that you, you just took from Amazon to your website. How often do you think that sales are lost in the transition from website to Amazon, right? Cause I'm a prime member. I'm going to go check. I'm going to go check Amazon for your product. How, I mean, yeah. how many sales do you think people are losing from that transition? Man. So actually I was just working with someone um, last week. He's actually a friend of mine. He, he invented this really cool uh, uh, special tripod for um, like vloggers. Mm -hmm. And he, at first he was, I think, hesitant to get on Amazon because like he wanted kind of full control of his customers and the experience. And he, uh, he built it to be like, like pretty high quality and high end as nice packaging. And he really cared a lot about like the overall customer experience, what emails they were going to get after purchasing it and, um, you know, just stuff like that. And it's like his website's great. You know, like everything about it was like a great user experience. So he was like, man, I don't want to like give that up. Uh, he's done like a pretty good job with the uh, like influencer marketing and yeah, primarily influencer marketing. They're all linking back to a site and that was fine. So he didn't think that he was like losing many sales by not being on Amazon because it's like, oh, they just have to go to the website. So then uh, like he reached out to me because he's like, hey, someone else is selling my pro like one of, oh, so he also sells it to um, which is like a, a handful of other retailers. And he's like, hey, one of my retailers are on Amazon. Like how do I report that to Amazon and get them kicked off? 
Um, and I was like, well, like you can't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, that's fair game. Like they're selling your product as new. And it was, uh, it wasn't prime. It was fulfilled by merchant. And when I showed him like jungle sky, you could see like this thing was selling like 10 a day Man. on a pretty high margin item that didn't have prime and it was seller fulfilled. I was like, dude, you have to get on Amazon. Yeah. They're making 10 sales a day. Like this is like, you know, uh, this profit margin, like 30 or 40 bucks on one of these things. So it was like a significant amount of money in daily sales. Someone else was capturing all of them. And you know, they were just, they're one of his retailers. So they were just ordering them from him. And like, they were capturing all this profit and all these sales. And I'm like, yeah. And you could so easily, uh, like just do way better than what they're doing. So, you know, that's just kind of like one story about that. Everyone's situation is a little bit different, but it's like, man, I feel like pretty much everyone needs to be on Amazon unless you just have like such a powerful brand that people will jump through hoops in order to get it. Like it makes sense to me that Apple wasn't on Amazon for a little while. Cause like if I wanted the AirPods, man, the fact that AirPods weren't for sale on Amazon that had to go to Apple's website, like whatever, whatever. I wanted AirPods. Yeah. Like, I didn't want these crappy knockoff Bluetooth ones. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, so brand though, let's say that I'm in a category where I don't care. You know, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm brand agnostic and I come in and I'm doing my evaluation. I'm using social proof as you, as you talked about before. Let's say I make a purchase for a product that I've, I don't know the brand and which is pretty typical, right? A lot of people, they, they buy their, uh, their first product from a brand with ha having no experience with it. Mm -hmm. um, when that person comes back to Amazon to buy, are they likely going to, to move towards that brand or does it just reset? You know what I mean? Do they, they're then out for a new search, new social proof, and they just don't care about the previous brand that they bought. Hard to say, but to be <laughs> honest, like I'm just thinking in my experience, man, that search kind of starts over. Like unless, you know, it's, unless it's something like really wowed you and, you know, I guess if it's kind of a, you know, an item you have to reorder each month and like, okay, I knew I had, you know, like, yeah, I like that water filter that came in. I'll, I'll try to find the same one. But I don't know. I mean, to be honest, me, like, I don't really go back in my orders and try to find something I've ordered before. I just search again and see if there's something that's rated better and better price now. <laughs> yeah. And I, I almost wonder, like, you know, the, going back to the example of uh, the Instagram to the website, you know, I, I land on the website. I'm, I'm an Amazon Prime member. So I'm on my phone, right? I leave my Google Chrome app and I touch Amazon, my Amazon app. And then I have to do a new search. Mm. And then I have to look through all those products to find your brand. Right. <laughs> There's probably tons of people who are losing, who are losing sales in that, in that part of the funnel. I just I wonder right. if, there's, if there's a way to, uh, to mitigate that, right? Just put something on your website that links straight to Amazon. But that's, that's like heresy to a lot of these brands. What do you think? Yeah. I, I do know that some people do that though. I, some, I know a f few people who have had good success with, uh, they don't necessarily do it long term, but they'll do that like to launch a new product, to, like drive a bunch of extra sales or drive some of their sales to Amazon to, yeah, like kind of get it going on Amazon. Like they'll replace the buy now essentially with a link uh, straight to the page on Amazon. And yeah, I think they know that it converts quite well. Um, but man, that'd be a really interesting test. Yeah, I got to run some data, run, run the numbers on that and see what the actual, the bounce rate becomes. Yeah. And you could, now that they have the, uh, the attribution program, you could pretty effectively like run that test, but man, I bet you a lot of brands would be pretty surprised with the results of that, that like, even with sending the customers off your website straight to Amazon, just have them check out there. Like if that's what they were, yeah, I bet a lot of these brands lose a lot more to the exact situation that you described than what they think. Right. A sale's a sale, you know, in my mind, you might as well monetize it. Don't want to lose them. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I guess the argument is, okay, well, what's the, what was the lifetime value of the customer? You know, the follow-up emails, all that kind of stuff. Like uh, assuming you have other products for sale that you think the same customer would get, or, you know, like the lifetime value of a customer to use pretty high. Like you might not be able to justify it with all that being said, but yeah, I mean, if it's, if you have like a one skew business, you know, like just like this tripod I'm talking about, like this invention that he had, like, 
I don't know, man. I would actually probably encourage them to try that test you were just talking about. <laughs> yeah, and then you're, you're all about launching more, more products too. So don't just stick with one SKU. Um, we're coming to the end of our time. Um, thank you so much for coming on, Greg. Um, tell, tell everybody what, what Jungle Scout's working on, some of the new tools uh, that you guys are, are launching or have launched that in the last couple, in the next couple months. Yeah, so I've been really stoked with all of our releases in the past uh, the past few months. Like, we've had so many teams working like all summer long. It was really cool because a lot of this stuff was ready to kind of the same time. So for the past uh, eight or ten weeks, we've been doing uh, or we did like a product launch every or feature launch every single week, which was really cool. So we came out with uh, some new functionality to find products. Um, some better keyword research functionality, uh, keyword rank tracking. We're releasing, we've already released some really cool analytics stuff for your business, but we're coming out with some new stuff in the next few weeks. So, you know, a lot of people still think of Jungle Scout as like a product research tool when in reality it's uh, transitioned to a lot more than that. So yeah, it's really cool. Right on. Uh, junglescout.com. Go and check it out. Greg Mercer, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. Thanks a lot for having me on. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Buy Box Experts podcast. Be sure to click subscribe, check us out on the web, and we'll see you next time.